Yeah, good morning. Welcome to the class. Uh, if we could have any one person lead us in prayer, please, committing the class into the Lord's hands. If anyone, if anyone online would like to pray, that's also fine. Okay, uh, in that case, I'll just pray. Lord, we just thank you so much for today's class. We commit ourselves into your hands, O Lord. You're the one who brings the subject alive. Without you, O Lord, we would just be wasting our time. So we pray that you would speak through these verses, explain them to us, O Lord, going beyond whatever human words I can use. So we pray that, Lord, today's would be a blessed class in you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So yes, today we will get into Ch John chapters 12 and 13. Uh, we may not be able to complete all of chapter 13, but then we will go as far as we can. So the focus for today is John 12 and 13. Uh, so if we could start off with John chapter 12, uh, verse 1, uh, maybe we could read um, the first eight verses, because in the previous chapter we stopped with the uh, raising up of Lazarus. So Lazarus was brought back to life. Immediately after that event, uh, you have this particular account being described. So if someone could read out for us John chapter 12, verses 1 to 8, please. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha said, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spinkered, uh, anoint the feet of Jesus and dipped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of, of the oil. Then one of his disciples, Judas, screwed Simon, uh, son, who would betray him said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This is this he said not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. Then Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my uh, burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Yeah. So here we see that six days after, before the Passover, uh, Jesus has come to Bethany. Bethany is the place where you have uh, uh, Mary and her brother and sister staying. Uh, so now they want to uh, maybe have this dinner uh, to honor Jesus. So it says in verse 2, here a dinner was given and Jesus honor because of what he has done for Lazarus. However, it's not taking place in Lazarus' home. It's, in fact, taking place in a bigger house, uh, you know, in the house of Simon the leper. Maybe he had enough room in his house to accommodate a lot of guests. Uh, so um, it's taking place in the house of Simon the leper, but it's being done to honor Jesus. And so you have Martha, Mary, and Lazarus also attending uh, this particular uh, dinner. So at this point, uh, you have Mary bringing in this very expensive perfume uh, to uh, anoint Jesus' feet. This is something that was part of their culture. You know, it's a way of honoring uh, uh, someone that you consider very important. Uh, so if you anoint them with uh, expensive spices or with uh, perfumes, it is basically you're doing it as a gesture of honor and respect. Uh, so this is what Mary is now doing for uh, Jesus. And we are told by Judas, who is you know, very um, uh, knowledgeable when it comes to money matters. So he recognizes that this particular oil and the quantity that she has poured out uh, would actually amount to 300 denarii. So that's basically uh, how much pay you would get for one entire year of working. So if a working person... Uh, were to put in you know, his labor for an entire year, this is the amount that he would get at the end of the year. So that entire, uh, you know, something that is worth that much money has been broken and poured out in a matter of seconds. 
So he feels, oh my goodness, such a highly expensive thing, simply poured out and it's not dripping all over the floor. Uh, so, it's, so he looks at it and he feels, oh my, it's such a great waste. Uh, so, which is why he objects. Um, now, uh, we see in the Gospels two events where anointing of Jesus' feet is done. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and John are mentioning uh, the story of this Mary who anointed at Bethany in Judea. Okay, so it's referring to the uh, sister of Lazarus. However, Luke talks about another anointing of the feet which takes place not in Bethany, but in Galilee, a completely different place. So that involves a woman who was a, uh, a sinner. Okay, so let us not get those two stories mixed up. Matthew, Mark, and John are referring to the anointing of Jesus' feet, which is done by Lazarus' sister. But Luke, on the other hand, talks about an event which takes place in Galilee in a different place, Luke 7, 36 to 50, where it talks about a sinful woman who has been forgiven and given a second chance at life. She comes and she anoints Jesus' feet. That's a different story altogether. So here in this particular story, uh, we see Judas so offended to see that something so valuable, you know, basically spread out, spread out all over the floor at Jesus' feet. And he thinks, oh my, what a complete waste. That is the value which he places on Jesus. On the other hand, look at the value which Mary places on Jesus. It really does not matter to her that she has taken something that expensive and broken it. Um, why would people even have something like this in their homes? It was a form of you know, business investment. Um, now, of course, you have stocks and shares and all of that. Uh, but in those days, you know, how do you invest in money? You basically purchase gold, you store it. Uh, or you purchase spices and you know, perfumes like this, which basically, basically come all the way from India and you know, our, uh, our side of the world. And so they are, ex you know, imported by these people in uh, in Israel and all and they're highly expensive by the time they go and reach over there so and it's small in size right I mean it's just a small bottle you can easily store it so in in your time of need let us say 10 years from now you know you're financially in a bad state then you can take this very very expensive perfume sell it to the highest bidder and with that money you know you'll be able to uh, do whatever it is that you're planning on doing so it's an investment which they have made. So she takes this very highly expensive investment and literally just pours it out. You know, some of it would have stuck to Jesus' feet. Most of it would have just gone on the floor. So um, this is the value that she attaches to Jesus. How valuable is Jesus? Jesus is much more valuable than this, but this is the best that she could do. And so she has honored him in this way. Judas looks at the same thing. And then in another gospel, it says even the other disciples also protested. They look at it and they think, oh my goodness, half of it has gone on the floor. What a complete and total waste. So we see the contrast about how much value each of them attached to the savior of the world. Uh, you know, So um, Jesus says, leave her alone. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. Did Mary know that this was what her perfume was intended for? She had no clue. But she gets to participate in something that had eternal significance. Because long before even the world was created, God had already decided that one day he would send his son as a sacrifice. And so for the son of his, his this divine uh, son of his to be sacrificed, someone needs to pre make the burial preparations. And God was looking to see whom can he choose for this highest honor. I mean, if he had asked one of the angels to do it, they would have gladly, you know, been thrilled to come and perform this ceremony of preparing the king of kings for the greatest, most ultimate sacrifice which would ever be done in the history of the universe. So it is a very honorable thing. And who got chosen for that? An insignificant woman who never even knew that what she is doing is going to have eternal significance down the line. And so in, uh, in Matthew, this is what Jesus says about, uh, about what she has done. If someone could go to Matthew chapter 26, 
uh, verses 12 to 13. Matthew 26, verses 12 to 13, please. Matthew 26, 12 to 13. Thir 12 and 13. For in that she had poured his an ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, whosoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, they shall also this, that this woman had done, be told for a memori memorial for her. Yeah, you know, putting that in simpler English in the NIV, it says, truly I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. She is the one who has prepared the Messiah for the gospel which is to follow, you know, the gospel of the cross. She is the one who was given the privileged honor of preparing the king of kings, the royal sacrifice for this great deed. How did she get chosen for such a, something so high? And without her even realizing that she was doing something so, you know, eternal and something so valuable. Um, we, we, we know a little bit about who she is, you know, I mean, uh, uh, about um, uh, her background, right, from one of the previous stories which are there in the Gospels. Um, uh, when we see the, you know, on an earlier occasion when Jesus had visited their home, Martha was very busy, you know, honoring Jesus by preparing the food and making all the arrangements so that, you know, she can um, entertain him in a way which he deserves in a way that the Messiah deserves. So she was giving her best. But Mary did not participate in any of those preparations. She was sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to him. At that point, this is what Jesus says to Martha when she complains about how her sister is not helping, uh, you know, not helping in giving the Messiah a grand entertainment. Uh, so this is what Jesus says at that time. Luke chapter 10, verses 41 and 42. We are leading up to something. So, you know, we are not just simply digressing from our portion. Uh, we are trying to lead up to a learning. So, yeah, if someone could read out for us Luke chapter 10, verses 41 and 42, please. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary, Mary has chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Yeah, so here... Uh, Jesus says, um, I came to your home and both of you are trying to honor me in two different ways. But one has chosen the better portion. You know, if, you look, if, if you were to look at that actual here, Greek word used over there, that word literally talks about the better portion. Like for instance, you know, when you sit at the dining table and you have different foods which are kept on the dining table, there are some portions which are good but then you have the best portion, you know, the most valuable dish which has been placed over there on the table. That is the better portion. That's the best portion. So you can help yourself to the different items which are there on the table. But if you are wise, you will basically go for the better portion, the one which is the, the you know, the centerpiece, the most, um, uh, you know, celebrated dish which is sitting there on the table. So it's actually a food term. So here Jesus says, Mary has chosen the better portion. So she too could have been busy, you know, honoring me by making all the arrangements. But she chose the better portion. What was that? To sit at my feet and learn from me. And that was a wise move because it changed her into a person who was able to catch the heart of God in very everyday things, normal everyday things. So... Without her even realizing it, she was in the right place at the right time doing the right thing when Jesus came on the second occasion and she literally prepared the royal sacrifice, the Lamb of God for the cross. Something which, you know, an, an honor which the angels would have fought over if they had been given the opportunity to do that. So the point that I'm trying to get across is Mary chose a lifestyle. She made a choice to live in a particular way where she would be synchronized in sync with the heart of the Lord so that she would always be in the right place, doing the right things at the right time, sometimes without even realizing it. If you and I were to make a choice to live in the way Mary did, 
we too will accomplish things of eternal significance without even realizing it. So, you know, during, during the rest of this day, each of you are going to be fulfilling so many responsibilities. Some of them are just things which need to be done because, you know, we all have responsibilities here on earth. But there are going to be some things which you will be doing which are going to bear eternal significance. One day you'll be rewarded in heaven for them and the Lord will say what you did, this one thing which you did on this particular day, you know, how it impacted my kingdom, how it impacted my purposes, how it impacted and blessed the people whom I love. And the Lord would tell you what you actually achieved through that very simple thing which you would have done during the you know, routine of your day. So living like the way Mary did prepares us for things of eternal value. Without her realizing it, now onwards, wherever the gospel is preached in the world, what she has done will also be talked about because she's the one who prepared events for this gospel to happen. So that is the immensity of what she did. So, jo so Judas completely lost it. I mean, he contributed nothing in spite of having lived in the inner circle, you know, with Jesus and being mentored by him for three years. He contributed nothing. He lost everything. This lady, on the other hand, because of the attitude and the steps which she took, she contributed something of lasting and eternal value. And what she was able to accomplish, we too can accomplish if we have her priorities, if we choose the better portion where spending time with him, honoring him, upholding him becomes more important even when it looks like a waste of time and money. You know, because sometimes it feels like as if what you're doing for the Lord is such a waste. Half of it is poured out on the, on the floor. And you'll think, okay, what's the big deal? You know, it's going to be wiped off tomorrow. Someone will come and wash the floor and all this costly perfume will be wasted. You may think that way. But if you really are placing him first and you value him that much and you're giving the best that you have, even though that best which you have is maybe not very great, it has eternal repercussions. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the takeaway which we can, you know, get from this particular story. The contrast between Judas and this lady, Mary, a very insignificant woman who achieved something very great. From there, we move on to the next passage uh, where you have large crowds of Jews coming to see Jesus because they all want to see the person who raised somebody from the dead after four days of the body decaying. So they all want to see this Jesus. And so there are large crowds coming to him. And of course, the leaders are very jealous of all the popularity which Jesus is gaining. If we could have someone read out this entire you know, passage for us, uh, all the way from verse 9 up to verse 16. John 12, 9 to 16, please. The reason I ask others to read is because it, it kind of gives me a chance to rest my voice a little bit. Uh, so if someone could please. John chapter 12 from verse 9. Now a, now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, when whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also. Death also. Because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. The next, the next day, a great multitude and I had come to the feast when they had heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. When, the, when Jesus... Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it as it is written, Fear not, doctor of Zion, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey clot. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when, they, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Therefore, the people who were with him yeah, maybe we can maybe cover that verse later. 
So if we look at this portion here, there are large clouds, crowds coming to see Jesus. And the chief priests are now so worried about uh, what's going to happen. You know, they're scared that if Jesus is appointed as the king, then the Romans will be very angry and they'll come and take away all of their power. And so they want to kill Jesus as well as Lazarus. Uh, and so uh, with that idea, they begin to conspire. In the meantime, the crowd is in a high spirits because, you know, they think that this is finally the Messiah who has arrived. And so even as Jesus is entering the city, they take palm branches uh, to greet him. Um, so this is what they say, even as he's entering or uh, riding on a young donkey. Uh, they say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, where is this wording taken from? Uh, it's basically from your Psalms 113 to Psalm 118. Those Psalms, that section of Psalms, Psalm 113 to Psalm 118, that's basically called the Halal. These are the Psalms which are basically sung uh, and recited during the Passover festival. So these Psalms, they focus on how God will come and bless his people, how he will help his people, how he will deliver his people. So the, the focus of, this, of these Psalms is that they are Psalms of praise uh, where the people are saying, we know Yahweh that you will be there for us, that you will save us, that you will redeem us. And uh, so Psalm 118 verses 25 to 26 is basically what they are uh, you know, uh, quoting right now when Jesus is walking into the city, uh, when Jesus is riding into the city, they are they actually uh, uh, quote the verses which are from Psalm 118. If someone could read out that for us, Psalm 118 verses 25 and 26. Save now, I pray, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, He and He has given us light. Yeah, okay. So here we see in Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26, you know, they say, Lord, save us. That's the Hebrew word Hoshiana, Hosanna, which basically means save us, help us. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the wording which they use. And um, um, it's not charging, is it? Let it not die out during the class, please. It is so. Where would I see? Okay, I think it is. Yeah, huh? yeah, sorry, very sorry for that interruption. Uh, yeah, so that word Hoshiana, Hosanna, basically is talking about, you know, it's a cry which literally means, Lord, save us. And who's going to save us? The one who comes in the name of the Lord. So in verse, Psalm 118, verse 26, it says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So they believe that, the, that this Jesus, he is coming in the name of the Lord. He will save them. He will grant them success. And so from the house of the Lord, they are blessing him. Okay, so they're literally um, singing out the Hallel to him, even as he comes. And uh, Jesus seems to be meeting all the criteria required because he is entering riding on a young donkey. He's again fulfilling another Old Testament prophecy. Um, that would be uh, Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. Uh, so yes, if someone could read out that prophecy as well, Zechariah 9, 9 and 10. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming. King is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey. He called the fault of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. 
he shall speak peace to the nations his dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth so those who are familiar with these old testament prophecies uh, believe that jesus is fulfilling them just like it said in zechariah chapter 9 he is coming riding on a donkey uh, not not just any donkey it says the foal of a donkey you know uh, of a uh, of a young uh, colt which has not been ridden so far so he seems to be fulfilling all the prophecies and so they are very very happy and so they are welcoming him and saying blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord uh, so you know an observation which is generally made by the teachers of the bible they say they point out and they say if the king if, if, they, if, they, if the almighty god is sending his you know his uh, messenger his son to an evil sinful people he should have sent his messenger on a war horse to come and destroy them all because you know people have been living in sin but while the people are still in their sins god shows decides to show them love instead so rather than sending his divine messenger on a war horse to destroy them he rather he sends them on an animal of peace on a donkey which is an animal of peace so he is not come to destroy the people rather he has come to save the people you know that's a, that's another additional uh, lesson that we can learn from this particular entry of jesus into jerusalem and so the people want to uh, anoint him and appoint him as their king however you know we are aware of the fact that they want to appoint him for political reasons they hope to gain um, political freedom from the romans they are not really interested in spiritual deliverance so their focus was in fact wrong which is why later when the entire crowd gets to know that jesus is not interested in political uh, victory you know the entire crowd shouts and says crucify him crucify him so the same people once their hopes are dashed once their political ambitions are dashed they you know they cry out and they say crucify him so we see that happening um now uh, maybe we can read out verses 17 to 23 yeah someone could read out verses 17 to 23 many in the crowd had seen jesus calls lazarus from the tomb raising him from the dead and they were telling others about it that was the reason so many went out to meet him because they had heard about this miracle sign then the pharisees said to each other there is nothing we can do look everyone has gone after him some greeks who had come to jerusalem for the passover celebration paid a visit to philip who was from bethsaida in galilee they said sir we want to meet jesus philip told and about it and they went together to ask jesus jesus replied now the time has come for the son of man to enter into the glory into his glory i tell you the word truth unless a uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Of... we can maybe cover that verse later but yeah up to 23 where it says the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified so we see two responses here there are people even coming from other gentile nations and they are eager to meet this jesus who was able to raise someone from the dead after four days of the body decaying you know so uh, there you have greeks coming over here and they respectfully approach philip and they say please you know give us a chance to meet with jesus um on the other hand you have the pharisees who are very very upset and they're saying see this is getting us nowhere look how the whole world has gone after him so they are uh, uh, not at all happy with the miracle which has taken place rather they are jealous of what jesus has achieved on the other hand you see the greeks eager to meet him and learn from him and so in this setting jesus says the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified how is the son of man glorifying himself by climbing on the cross hanging over there naked you know humiliated and mocked at by the soldiers this is the manner in which he is glorifying himself you no know? so he says the hour has finally come just as he had said 
that people even from other sheep folds will hear his voice or oh, no all those who belong to him they will hear his voice and they will respond and they will come to him so now even the greeks are coming they have heard the true sheep have heard his voice and they're all coming to him so now it is time for the shepherd to lay down his life for his sheep and so he says you know i the hour has now come for the son of man to be glorified we looked at another um, event of glorification you know in our last class where we were considering how jesus allowed delayed his going back to uh, to bethany uh, to glorify the name of god so we see that the way god glorifies himself is not always the way we humans would uh, you know regard glorification we only think in terms of positive happy joyful events but on the previous occasion how did god glorify himself by delaying going to lazarus and healing him here how is the son of man glorifying himself by allowing himself to be completely humiliated you know on a cross and bearing that sacrifice you know uh, i mean paying the uh, paying the sacrifice for us so we see god glorifying himself in ways which we may not usually consider uh, you know terms to be associated with glory so in our small human limited thinking let us not restrict the lord and say that just because something bad has happened to me oh see the lord is not glorifying himself in my life let us not limit him in that way he who is all knowing all powerful and all wise knows how to glorify himself so he will sometimes use even negative things to bring about glory to himself okay so uh, we can trust in him even when negative things are happening in our lives and in our homes uh, so we can continue to claim you know victory even when things are going badly because he will ultimately glorify himself by doing good to his people um so um moving on from there uh, jesus explains about you know his uh, glorification how it's going to be brought about so yes if we can maybe repeat verse 23 and also look at uh, up to verse 26 um or maybe even up to verse 30 so if we can have someone read out for us from 23 up to verse 30 please first 23 and jesus answered them saying the hour has come that the son of man should be glorified verily verily i say unto you except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die it abide alone but if it dies it bring forth much fruit he that loveth life shall lose it and he that hated life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal if any man serve me let him follow me and where i am there shall also my servant be if any man serve me him will my father honor now in my soul is is my soul troubled and what shall i say father save me from this hour but for this cause i came into this hour father glorify thy name then came there a voice from heaven saying i have both glorified it and will glorify it again yeah and these words which we these verses which we read out are filled with that one word glory glory it keeps getting getting repeated you know so how is the son of man glorifying himself by choosing to die because he says if a seed is you know just sitting there in a corner it achieves nothing but if you bury it in the ground and allow it to die out of the dead seed you have an entire crop you know new life coming out so the lord says in the same way i am willing to die you too must be willing to die you too must be willing to become living sacrifices and so he says you must hate your life in this world god is not asking us to hate our lives per se you know um we are supposed to value our lives Uh, but he says hate your life in this world in the sense the things which are temporary the things which are just of this world for a short duration hate those things you know so that you prioritize eternal things more so over here he's using the word hate you know in the sense of priorities because in another place jesus says you have to hate your father and mother is the lord saying that we should actually literally hate our parents no it's talking about priorities 
you know it's it's a it's a greek usage of that term where that word hate is talking about priorities where you honor god more than your father or mother so here in the same way you value eternal things more than the things of this life so you choose to uh, sacrifice temporary worldly things which are of the world you sacrifice them so that you can honor the lord in an eternal manner you know that will have eternal reward so the lord says my father will honor the one who serves me so if you're willing to make sacrifices of good worldly things you know things like um you know your family your income so if you're willing to make sacrifices in those areas to honor him whenever he asks for a certain sacrifice if you're willing to do that uh, to honor him it says so the father will honor you one day you know so uh, jesus is asking them to seek an eternal reward in the same way he is also working towards an eternal reward so with this attitude jesus says you know uh, jesus prays and says father glorify your name i'm willing to go to any extent i'm willing to make any sacrifice so that your name will be glorified so father go ahead do what you want to do glorify your name and then when jesus you know prays in that manner of deep submission and reverence a voice from heaven literally a audible voice from heaven says i have glorified it and will glorify it again and we are giving this explanation the crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered um, others said an angel had spoken to him and then jesus says the voice was for your benefit so that the word, the people will know that the father is pleased with what he is doing and the father will glorify himself through jesus if you notice over here there are two responses from the crowd which hear this thing they literally hear it with their ears but to some people it sounds like thunder but to another set of people they can hear the words which are being spoken and they are, they say an angel has spoken to him they don't realize that it's literally god the father speaking and they assume that an angel has spoken so some people hear the words some people don't hear the words those who have an openness in their spirit to hear spiritual truths are able to actually hear the words john is also no, john the writer he is also able to hear the words and so he records the words over here in verse 28 and what do the words say the words are basically i have glorified it and will glorify it again so those whose hearts are open to receive spiritual things were able to hear the words but those whose hearts were closed to spiritual things who had no interest or desire for spiritual things they just heard thunder and that's what happens in bible college a lot of people hear the thunder coming from the teachers voices but they don't hear the words which the holy spirit is speaking because there's, there's there are things which the lord wants to impart human teachers can only talk there's not much that they can do but if there's a student sitting over there who really has an open heart and has a hunger for spiritual things they will go beyond what the teacher is saying and they will hear the voice of the holy spirit ministering to them personally but students who are just sitting over there maybe for the sake of the certificate or some for whatever reason will just hear the thunder and they will go away not having heard the actual words of life so it is so important you know whether it is a in a classroom setting or whether it's in the church or wherever even when we are just simply watching youtube and listening to a sermon on youtube we need to be able to go beyond just the uh, words which are being spoken and if there's a hunger in our hearts the lord will speak to us the lord will minister to us we will hear things while the others just simply hear the thunder okay so we see that happening over here with the crowd we see two different responses that is why jesus says this voice was for your benefit so everyone who had that hunger benefited the others didn't benefit they just went away thinking that they heard heard some thunder all right moving on from there let's look at what jesus says in verses 31 to 33 very significant statement that jesus is making because he said right the hour has come the son of man is uh, now going to be glorified 
and this is how the son of man is going to be glorified when he's hanging over there naked on the cross it's not a humiliation something very momentous is happening in that moment and jesus talks about that in verses 31 to 33 if someone could read out verse 31 now now is the judgment of this world now shall the prince of this world be cast out and i if i be lifted up from the earth will draw all men unto me this he said signifying what death he sh should die yeah we, we would need to dwell a little bit on these three verses because our lives you know kind of depend on that uh, you know all these little situations that we face every day on a daily basis it's so connected with what jesus is saying over here he's come over here to achieve something great and he says now is the time for judgment on this world now the prince of this world will be driven out and i when i am lifted up from the earth will draw all people to myself so all the people who believe in him and are you know willing to submit to him he will draw them to himself and they will share in this great victory which is being achieved on the cross so he says now is the time for judgment on this world now the prince of this world will be driven out so on the cross judgment was declared upon the people who have cho you know chosen not to follow jesus and judgment was also declared upon satan and all of his demons uh, it's a very final work of victory which jesus accomplished so anyone who has recognized that jesus was lifted up on our behalf and is willing to you know thank him and place themselves under his protection they will get to share in this amazing victory which was won what did the people say when jesus was hanging on the cross in that helpless humiliating condition you know what did the people say let's look at what they said in matthew chapter 27 verses 41 to 43 matthew 27 41 to 43 41 to 40. Likewise, the chief priest also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He served other, himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now. If he will have him, if we will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. Yeah. Even? So uh, yeah, yeah. So the people they mock Jesus when he's hanging on that cross in that helpless condition, and they say, "Look at him! If God was for him, God would now come and rescue him." So they think that judgment is being passed upon Jesus when Jesus was hanging there on that cross. The world thought that it is Jesus who is getting judged, but this is what Jesus declares and says. He says, "Now is the time for judgment on this world." Now the prince of this world will be driven out. So the judgment is not coming upon Jesus. The judgment is actually coming upon the prince of the world, Satan and his followers. Which is why in Colossians chapter 2 verses 14 and 15, this is what we are told. Our entire Christian walk, you know, our faith, our victory is based on these verses. Colossians 2, 14 to 15, if someone could read out. Colossians 2, 14, 15. Colossians 2, 14 and 15. Having beeped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having discernment, principalities and powers he made a public spectless spectacle of them triumphing over them in it all right so here there is judgment happening on that cross but it's not that uh, it's not a judgment upon jesus rather what is happening over there it says having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us 
he has taken it away nailing it to the cross so all the shortcomings and the sinfulness you know the, the, the sinful things which we have done all that is a list against each one of us there's a legal list against each person saying you have uh, rebelled against the living god in all of these ways in all of these ways you have fallen short of what god requires in all of these ways you deserve to be punished for these particular deeds which you have thought which you have done which you have said so there's a long legal list of accusations against each one of us jesus takes this list and he nails it to the cross and he pays the price for all of those things which you and i have done so as long as we were legally indebted the evil one had control over us but once Jesus finished paying the price for what we have done our sins our shortcomings he has taken the punishment now the evil one does not have a hold over us anymore so after having nailed this list you know which is which stands against each of us this list of accusations of what we have done once he nailed it to the cross and he finished paying the price he cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness so after having done that on our behalf he has disarmed the powers and authorities and made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross so he has declared to all these principalities and powers to satan and his demons look you no longer have hold of over these people who have accepted my sacrifice and placed themselves under my covering because i have paid the price for all the list of accusations which was there on the list it's all covered it's all been paid for i paid for it now you have no hold over them any longer so out of that position of victory now we can fight a spiritual warfare against satan and his demons so there was judgment taking place on the cross but it was not a judgment upon jesus it was judgment upon satan and his evil spirits look how the son of man glorified himself i mean to human eyes it looked like a complete failure a weak beaten up man bleeding thirsty hanging over there with all his you know all his human joints out of joint he he looked like the picture of failure but in that moment an amazing victory was won for us so we can stand in that position of victory and fight against the evil one when he tries to continue maintaining his hold upon us we can declare and say you have no right over us because jesus judged you on the cross the prince of this world was driven out his power was taken away so that is the declaration which jesus is making over here in these verses so it's very important for us to understand this so jesus became a curse for us jesus became the propitiation for us but jesus was not judged on that cross it was satan and his demons who were judged on that cross it's important for us to recognize this and uh, because you see this is how the crowd responds they say we have heard from the law that the messiah will remain forever so how can you say the son of man must be lifted up you are saying the son of man will die but then the scripture says messiah will live forever so how can he be defeated so now we have understood it was not a defeat yes the son of man was lifted up but by lifting by by allowing himself to be lifted up he actually won a victory he actually declared and brought a judgment so rather than defeat happening victory did happen the crowd does not understand that and they say how can it be because you're saying that the son of man will die and so um they don't understand what he is saying um yeah i think it's time for your break so we will stop over here and then when we come back from the break we'll look at um, some more important verses thank you <laughs> 